Okay, so today's lecture, we're going to finishing up uh, Sex Chapter 4, and I'm finishing up the last part of Section uh, 4.5 on the dimensional argument, and then we're going to go on into rank and uh, then the change of basis and finish up Chapter 4. And uh, start, uh, and then uh, by Thursday, I'm going to be moving on into Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is going to be focusing on the concept of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, a very special style basis for certain matrices and the like. So, um, again, uh, and then after that, we're going to have our next test. And then after that, if I've got some time, my goal is to move a little bit into Chapter 6. Uh, just to give you guys some idea of orthogonality, another special type of basis, and uh, you know, and, and focusing on how to create these particular guys. But I consider anything we do in Chapter Six actually icing on the cake. The goal here is to get through Chapter Five by the end of the semester, and then uh, basically dabble in a little bit of Chapter Six. But Chapter Five is our goal, and that's where your uh, last test is going to be on on Chapters Four and Five for Test Number Three. So we're getting there, and also look at this. Chapter four is kind of a long section. Chapter five hasn't got as many sections, many sections in it. Chapter four has got like seven sections. It's a, it's a little bit larger, larger chapter. Chapter five is not. So uh, pay attention to it. And so I believe our next homework set is due on Thursday. So therefore, um, after that, you you get um, another homework set will be coming very very soon. And then uh, just before our test, we'll look at both of those things to review, and then you'll have your test coming down the road. But uh, just pay attention to that. What day it's going to be actually on, uh, let me get into Chapter 5 a little bit, and then I can tell you that. All right. So let's pick up where we left off last time, which is <clears throat> over here with the subspaces of R3. I, kinda, I went over this a little bit with you guys, but then I kind of want to pick it up uh, a little bit more. Here and you've got the uh, these definitional things here. So now I tried to draw these things out for you guys last time. So subspaces of R three. So you got your x uh, x axis, y axis, and z axis. Your classic three dimensional space over here. And so if we look at something or other, subspaces of R three. So R three has three components. Okay, you know, in terms of classic vectors, you know it's uh, a b c type of vector here, but you could have subspaces. A subspace that is zero-dimensional would be having the, only the zero vector in it. Yeah, you know, the zero vector is called the trivial subspace. If you add two zero vectors, you get zero. Multiply constant times the zero vector, it's still the zero vector. If you go through all the subspace properties, yeah, it holds. It's trivial, but we consider this just having the zero vector as a subspace is zero-dimensional. A one-dimensional subspace means you have basically one vector. Remember, from what we talked about last time, the definition of dimension of a space is the number of elements in the basis, a number of vectors in the basis. So if I'm talking about a one-dimensional subspace, I've got one vector in the basis. And because you can take a vector and multiply it by any scalar and you're still inside your set, Basically, if you draw in R3, this is my space, if you have one vector, it will create a straight line multiplied by any constant, basically gives you a straight line. You take one vector multiplied by any constant, you get a, what they call a straight line vector. So a straight line is what a one-dimensional subspace is going to look like. A two-dimensional subspace, so you got two vectors in your basis, and any linear combinations of those two vectors gives you a plane inside of your R3. So any vector on this plane, aka like the sheet of paper in R3, any vectors on, in that piece of paper can be uh, made into a coordinate in terms of a, uh, a, a system of these two vectors uh, being added up and stuff. So um, this is what a two-dimensional subspace looks like. And then the three-dimensional subspace is actually going to be R3 itself. So, and you begin to look at these guys in terms of the different subspaces. So we just look at R3. And R3, again, what we're referring to is a vector that has three components, A, B, C. So let's talk about R4. What are the subspaces of R4? You could have the zero dimension. You could have one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, or all four, all four dimensions, which is all of R4 back again. So basically, 
you get from zero all the way up to the dimension of the space, I mean components in the vector, is the, all the subspaces that you can possibly have. So with that, quote, theorem. Let V be a p-dimensional vector space. Then any linear, then any linearly independent set of exactly p elements, vectors, in V is automatically a basis for V. And any set that of exactly p vectors, elements, vectors, that spans V is automatically a basis for V. So, goes to the question, are bases unique? And the answer is no. You can have a lot of different bases, okay? Basis is what we're basically going to create the space out of. Your basis for your subspace, your basis for your space, whatever. So if you're talking about V is your subspace, and it's p-dimensional, what does that tell me with p-dimensional? I have p vectors or elements in that make up the basis. I have p basis elements in there, okay? So, and to be a basis, what do you got to be? Linearly independent set of vectors that when I do in the linear combination of my basis, I should be able to get any vector that is defined inside of the vector space V. So what we're saying here is if I happen to switch a basis, as long as I, and knowing that the dimension is P, that tells me right there that I'm going to have to have P vectors in my basis. And they're going to be, to be a basis, they have to be linearly independent. So I can stick any vectors that come from P that as long as they're linearly independent and there are P of them, I can create another basis that will also span all of V. So bases are not unique. You can have all different kinds of bases. Now, why in the world do you want to change bases and stuff? Well, I mentioned to you guys last time about the idea of basically code theory. Okay? The basis is really sets up what the space is going to look like. Okay? But I don't want people to know what I'm doing. So I can make this stuff hard, okay? I can make it easy. If you use the standard basis, let's say we're talking about R3. What is the standard basis of R3? 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And I can get any vector in R3, A, B, C vector. You do A times 1, 0, 0, plus B times 0, 1, 0, and plus C times 0, 0, 1. That gives me the vector A, B, C. Well, that's pretty much like broadcasting in the clear. I think everybody could follow along in terms of my coefficients what the vectors are going to show up be. So you're not really coding it from anybody. Anybody can, can basically break that code because it's not really a code. It's in the clear. What you want to do is create a basis that makes it tough for people to figure out Okay, what are the elements, what are the basis elements, and things like that, and how are these guys comparing? And it takes some doings to, for you to figure out or to basically hack the system to figure out what exactly, what were the basis elements. The basis elements is what sets up basically your code for whatever you're playing with. And I, this day and age of, uh, you know, in the old days it used to be the classic military that did this stuff because they had to broadcast their information to the troops so they know what they're supposed to be doing but we didn't want the enemy to figure out what we're doing and stuff like that. But now the enemy is amongst us. They're all after our credit cards. So we got to hide our credit card information. So when you're on eBay or Amazon and you're typing in your credit card number to get whatever you're going to purchase from, from these guys, how do they actually code this stuff where you can type it in, but it's scrambled, but when it shows up at Amazon, they can unscramble it, figure out what your credit card number is, bill your credit card, and then scramble it back and send you confirmation that your credit card was charged. That's kind of what we're talking about here. The scrambling, unscrambling, that means you've got to have a different basis that one is not in the clear that makes it tough for people to kind of follow along. And if you look at your credit card, how many, element, how many digits are typically on your credit card? 16. Four, 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 four sets of four. You guys don't pay attention to credit cards. You're too young yet. Wait, when you start to pay the bill, then you'll know. Okay, so four sets of four. And then, wait a minute, there's more information you've got to give these people. What other information do you have to give to get, to get your credit card to be activated? Uh, expiration date. 
And that's usually either a, a, a you know, a, a, the expiration date code, you know, somewhere between 1 and 12, and then either a 2 or 4 digit year. And wait a minute, it's one more code. The three digit code on the back, the CRV code, whatever it's called, C, 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 V, C. I don't know. Let me see what it's called. Okay. Uh, it is called the, uh, oh, this one doesn't have a CVC code. Okay. Yeah, the three digit code on the back of your credit card. So all these things are still more security levels to tack on top of it. And again, how are these things being, you put it in your, your credit card, you type it in on, on the computer screen. I mean, that's public access. So wait a minute, is that? No, but what they're going to do is it's got to be a secure internet thing so no one's supposed to be hocked in, and it's going to take it immediately and code it. So it goes away, and then they got the code. They can unscramble it. They can descramble it and send it right back to you and stuff like that without the hackers knowing exactly what your credit card is. So there's possibilities for this. And keep changing it up. So today we have one particular basis. Tomorrow we'll switch it up to a different basis. It keeps the hackers keep working. So when they're about to break a code, keep switching your code. Okay? So every time you have a different basis, you basically are going to have a different code. You'll see that today. So keep going here. So the null space of A, which is the number of free variables in A uh, x equals 0, so now remember, the null space is the number of, basically the dimension of the null space. Dimension is supposed to be the number of vectors in the basis, right? But if you remember how you solve for the null space, you'll figure out very quickly that basically the dimension of the null space is the number of free variables in that AX equals zero when you actually solve that system of equations. And the dimension of the column space happens to be the number of pivots in A when you put it in reduced row echelon form. So there's this connection between free variables and the number of pivots and stuff. And there's going to be a major formula coming down the pike about how to connect these guys together. So, got a question for you. I can't stop without doing a particular problem here. So let's do a problem. Okay. Here's the question. Let A be equal to the matrix. Negative 3, 6, negative 1, 1, negative 7. 1, negative 2, 2, 3, negative 1. 2, negative 4, 5, 8, negative 4. And it's a 3 by 5 matrix. Could you please tell me the dimension of the null space and what the dimension of the column space is going to be? Okay. Well, how would I do that? Well, pick one. And basically, you can solve both of these two problems at the same time. So, first thing I'm going to do is, let's talk about the null space. So, how do I find the null space? Null space of A. So, what you got here is you're going to have AX equals 0. If you got A times X equals 0, how do you typically solve that guy? Augment it with zero. Very good. So this you would augment. You would take A, augment it with zero. But I got a question. What does augmenting with zero really do for you? Uh, not much. So this is negative 3, 6, negative 1, 1, negative 7, 1, negative 2, 2, 3, negative 1, 2, negative 4, 5, uh, 8, negative 4. You can augment with zero, but I'm going to show you that it's really pointless to augment with zero. You're just basically wasting the ink on writing the zeros each time. So if I was going to do this problem, okay, which I'm not because it takes too long, but you can do this on a test, I would row swap, row one and row two, and then I would sweep the one down here, <clears throat> sweep down and kill the negative three, sweep down and kill the two, and then take this guy, sweep down, then this guy, I'm going to sweep up, and when I do reduce row echelon form, I'm going to get this. 1, negative 2, 0, negative 1, 3, 0, 0, 1, 2, negative 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And since you told me to augment with 0, and there it is. But really, did I need to augment with 0? Because the zeros just make zeros to themselves. So 
you could save yourself some time and just go for, you actually don't have to write the zeros into this thing. And there's the, the ro reduced row echelon form of A. Does that make sense? Now, with that being said, now, can you tell me what the uh, null space is going to be? Well, this represents x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. And it was equal to 0. So you can rewrite these guys as equations. This would be x1 minus 2x2 minus x4 plus 3x5 equals 0. And the other one is going to be what? x3 plus 2x4 minus 2x5 equal to 0. Right here is where most people kind of fumble the ball at. So find the null space. What do you do to find the null space? Solve for the pivots. Who are the pivots? 1 under x1 and 1 under x3. I got two pivots, x1 and x3. So when you solve them, I end up getting this. x1 is equal to 2x2 plus x4 minus 3x5. x2, uh, sorry, x, x2 equals what? And what is x3 equal to? Let's solve for x3. x3 would be what? Negative 2x4 plus 2x5. These are my two pivots, right? But you've got to write it as a vector. That's where most people mess up. What is the solution vector going to look like? Well, how many components do I have in terms of my x unknowns? x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. I got five of them. x4, x5. x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. However, as I mentioned to you before, who are the free variables? x2 is a free variable because he's not a pivot. So x2 is equal to x2. x3 is not as a pivot. So there we go. x4 is a free variable. So x4 is equal to x4. And x5 is a free variable. So x5 equals x5. So these are my free variables. And x2. So now, how are you going to write this as a vector x1, x2, x3, x4, x5? What do we do? We look at the x2, and what are my, uh, my coefficients? 2, 1, there is no x3, there is no x4, and there is no x5. That's going to be times x2 uh, plus, the next one is x4. What are the coefficients? 1, there is no uh, x2, so that's a 0. A negative 2 on the x3, uh, 1 on the x4, and a 0 on the x5. That's times x4 plus, let's see if I can squeeze this in here. And then you've got your x5, which is negative 3. There's a no x no no x five for x two there. There's a two on the uh, x three two x five. There is a uh, zero on the x four and x five is equal to himself. And there's a one, and that's times x five. So I got a question for you. There is the solutions right there for the null space of a. You with me? If you write it as a basis. The null space of A is equal to the span of what vectors? 2, 1, 0, 0, 0. 1, 0, negative 2, 1, 0. And negative 3, 0, 2, 0, 1. This is the basis. And the span means all the linear combinations of those basis vectors. But I ask you the question, what was the dimension of the null space of A? How much? What's the definition of basis? Uh, 
uh, what, excuse me, what's the definition of the dimension of the basis? The number of vectors in the basis. How many vectors I got in the basis? Three. So the dimension is three. My question to you, and trying to, what I'm trying to link back to what I stated a few seconds ago, did I actually have to solve this darn thing to tell you what the dimension of this thing was? No. Why did I not? How many free variables do you have? X2 was free. X4 was free, and X5 was free. How many free variables? Three. The dimension of the null space will be the same as the number of free variables in your solution. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's talk about, since I did all this beautiful work, let's talk about, so dimension of the null space is three. What would the dimension of the column space be? Well, let's just talk about what the column space is. What's the column space of A? It's going to be the span of who? Well, here's the deal. I did reduce row echelon form on this guy, and the column space is going to be basically, it's the number of linearly independent vectors, right? And what tells me they're linearly independent is where the, the, where the uh, uh, pivots show up at. So look at the pivots. How many pivots do I have? Two. Two. Where are they located at? Remember, column space, we look at the columns. Column one and column three. But because we did reduce row echelon form, these columns are not equivalent. The rows are equivalent, and I'll talk about that in a second, but the columns are not equivalent. So... I have to go back to the original A matrix and talk about where the pivots are located. They're in column one and in column three. So that is negative three, one, two, and negative one, two, five. Does that make sense? That is the column space. It's the span of these two vectors. But I couldn't use the uh, reduced row echelon form on this guy because uh, we, we, we're looking for column space. I can reduce, reduce, reduce column, then I could get some equivalent terms. But all I needed was the pivots. So what was the dimension of this particular space? How many pivots did I have? Two. So what I'm telling you right here, when I, I ask you the question about dimension, I don't actually have to go and solve the system. I did, just to show you the connection here, but I don't have to do that. All I had to do was just take my matrix, put it in REF, reduce row echelon form. The number of pivots will tell me the dimension of the column space. And the number of free variables, non-pivots, x2, x3, x5, the number of those things, which is 3, will be the dimension of the null space. So I don't have to do so much work to figure out these dimensions. Does that make sense? Did I lose you anywhere? So, these two guys right here, is there a pattern with this stuff? Yeah. Note. If I take the dimension of the null space of, and add it to the dimension of the column space of A, it's always equal to a certain number. What number is that going to be? If you look at this matrix right here, you know, this was size, it was 3 by 5, okay? And if you just declare him to be M by N, the 3 plus the 2 is equal to what? 5, which is the N. M by N, it's always equal to N. And there is a formula right here. So if you just give me one of them and tell me what the matrix is, I can find the other one pretty much for free by basic arithmetic. M, say so the dimension of the null space plus the dimension of the column space will always be equal to N on your M by N matrix. That will always be the case. Questions? All right, keep moving. Section 4.6, rank. 
This is just more terminology for you guys to get a hold of, okay? If A is an M by M matrix, each row of A has N entries, thus can be identified with the vectors in Rn. The set of all linear combinations of the row vectors is called the row space of A. So, you know, we talked about column space. We talked about null space. We also briefly, way back when in section 2.8, we mentioned the row space, but let's go back and revisit it. The row space of A is the linear, as all, all the linear combinations of the vectors in the rows. So I kind of drew on myself out of matrix. It's three by five or M by N, whatever. It's rows. So I got like three rows. This would be, uh, you know, it's all the linear combination of these three rows. Okay. But a little special note here. If, okay, first off, note. The row space of A is equal to the column space of A transpose. So, if we're playing around with the row space and you don't like the row space, you just don't like playing in rows because ever since day one in this class, our focus has been on column vectors. So you've been programmed. Well, no worries. Just take your matrix A, transpose it. What does transposing do? Turns the rows into columns. And then you can, the row space of A will be the column space of A transpose. And it's the same thing. And then you can transpose them back and you can get the right answer. So if you're unhappy with row space, well, don't worry about it. Do the column space of A transpose. So theorem 13 says this. If two matrices, A and B, are row equivalent, then their row space are the same. If B is in echelon form, that's either a reduced row echelon form or echelon form, R-R-E-F or R-E-F, the non-zero rows of B form a basis for the row space of A as well as a basis for B, the standard basis for the row space. So, in other words, here's a question for you I have right here. Okay? Here's a matrix A right here. I want you to, matrix A is going to be, uh, I may do something different, negative 2, negative 5, 8, 0, negative 17, 1, 3, negative 5, 1, 5, 3, 11, negative 19, 7, 1, 1, 7, negative 13, 5, negative 3. I want you to find the row space of A based upon the standard form. I want you to find the null space of A, standard basis for those two guys, and I want you to find the column space of A. Okay? And then we'll talk about the dimensions of those things. So let's first find these guys. So I'm going to come over here. And the first thing I'm going to do here is what? Well, I'm going to use my handy-dandy calculator. I know I brought it here. There it is. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is get myself a nice clean sheet of paper. It's always the best move. Okay. And so here we go. Let's recopy what matrix A is. Matrix A is the matrix negative 2, negative 5, 8, 0, negative 17, 1, 3, negative 5, 1, 5, 3, 11, negative 19, 7, 1, 1, 7, negative 13, 5, negative 3. Okay? Now, a lot of people have asked me, all right, the first thing you want to do with any kind of matrix, and again, remember the question, row space, null space, and column space, and we want a basis for these guys. All right. So here we go. The first thing you want to do to figure out what's going on is you want to sit here and figure out this guy. And personally, if I want standard basis, I want to put it in RREF format, reduce row echelon form. Okay? So, now I expect you guys to have the ability to do this. On a small matrices, I will tell you to do that on the test or whatever because I want to see the work. But on something bigger, I will put the words like 
you can use your calculator to do this, okay? Because it does take some time, and I want to try to put as many problems on the test as I can. So this is not really the question. This is to put in a reduced racial on form. That was from Chapter 1, Chapter 2, okay? This is, we're in Chapter 4, I'm about, to, about to move into Chapter 5 here. So let's go over here to Matrix just to show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to edit Matrix A. What size is this matrix? That's what you need to know. What size is this thing? Four by five. One, two, three, four rows. One, two, three, four, five columns. Four by five. Okay? Type in my numbers. Negative two, enter. Negative five, enter. Eight, enter. Zero, enter. Negative 17, enter. One, enter. Three, enter. Negative five, enter. One, enter, five, enter, three, enter, 11, negative 19, seven, one, one, seven, negative 13, five, and negative three, and don't forget to hit enter after the last guy. That's a common mistake. You have to hit enter, puts it into the memory of the calculator. Now, I'm going to do a second quit. I did that very quickly. And you know, if you screw up one of these numbers, what are the odds of you getting the problem correct? Zero. That's right. You guys know probability. Probability of zero getting it correct. The, again, this is where most people would make a mistake on this thing. Even if I had to do it by hand, I've got my teddy bear with me right here on the calculator. Here it is. I'm going to double check anything that I do because one false move makes an A paper into a C paper because you screwed it up and there's parts A, B, C, D, E, F, and G on each one of these problems. So you have to be careful. Careless error kills. So now I'm going to go back to matrix. I edited already. I'm just going to names and I called him A and, I'm going to hit, and I take him to the home screen and I hit enter. Now I typically type it in row wise. So I'm going to check my columns. Negative two, one, three, one. Negative two, whoop, that was supposed to be a negative five. I made a mistake. It happens to everybody. So what am I going to do? Go back, second matrix, edit, and go back and put him in. Four by five. It's negative two, negative five. Enter eight, zero, it's negative 17. I think the rest of them are good. So I'm going to go second quit, clear it out, and just basically recall down matrix A again, and I go back and double check him. You understand? Careless error kills them. Always double checking myself, because if you don't double check yourself, you are going to make a bonehead careless error, and then you don't want. You wonder why I, did, I understood how to do everything on the test, and yet I still made an 81 instead of a 99. Okay, it's because you didn't pay attention to what was going on on the problem, and you completely blew a bunch of points because your whole matrix is wrong. And once you screwed up in the beginning, all the other answers, whatever you do with it. I'm sorry, but you're missing the points out of it. I may give you some partial credit, but it won't be much. Okay, so double check this thing. So negative 2, 1, 3, 1, the good, negative 5, 3, 11, 7, 8, negative 5, negative 19, negative 13, 0, 1, 7, 5, negative 17. I can scroll over as you can see it. Negative 17, 5, 1, negative 3. Now I'm happy with it. Does that make sense? Double check yourself. Now second quit. Now... I'm going to clear that off. I'm going to go to matrix A, call him back up again. Then I'm going to go to ma matrix, then scroll over to math, and scroll down to my favorite button, which is, well, I need this one right here, so hold on. Let me go back and clear, clear this out. Go so second matrix, go over here to math, scroll down to reduce echelon form, and then you type in which matrix you want on matrix A. Reduce racial on form on matrix A. I hit enter, and this is what I get. Even if I had to do it by hand, I always, always double check with the calculator. My work matches with the calculator, I'm very happy. When my work doesn't match with the calculator, do I argue with the calculator? No. I argue with myself because I made the mistake. How many times have I had students, well, the calculator said, no, no, you go, you go with the calculator. Calculator's good. Well, I thought the calculator made a mistake. No, the calculator doesn't make a mistake. It's you, all right? 
And I got a row of zeros. Zero, 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 zero. Okay. Now, question for you. Now, this was the big work. I want you to find the row space of A. Row space of A. I'm going to give you two answers. Okay? The row space of A is, well, where are the pivots located at? And again, we're talking about row space, so look at the rows. Row 1, row 2, and row 3. You with me? So, I could talk about the vectors being, and usually with, with, with uh, vertical vectors here, excuse me, with horizontal vectors, I write little pointy brackets around there. Negative 2, negative 5, 8, 0, negative 17. 1, 3, negative 5, 1, 5. One other vector, which is the third vector, 3, 11, negative 19, 7, 1. And that would be my criteria. Wait a minute, I want a space, right? So what do I got to put in front of this word? Span is what creates space. This is the basis. Does that make sense? But I could have also said this. The row space of A is equal to the span of 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, negative 2, 0, 3, and 0, 0, 0, 1, Does that make sense? Well, I wrote it two different ways. Why am I allowed to do that? Well, first off, what is this RREF called? Reduced row echelon form. And I'm looking for the row space. So I can either use either matrix, the original matrix, or the reduced row echelon form of that matrix as a row equivalent. So these two guys are the same thing. But we're going to use this word standard basis. A standard basis is the basis with the most zeros in it. And so what gives me the most zeros in it is doing that reduced racial form on it. So this is my answer if I want the, quote, standard basis for this guy. Does that make sense? But I could have used this guy right here. Because these are row equivalent, I could have used the, the, the row, row one vector, row two vector, and row three vector, because that's where the pivots are located at. So there's two ways of me actually writing the same answer. However, if you go back and look at the original question that I asked for, which one did I ask for? Find the row space using the standard basis. So the actual answer that I would be looking for on a test or whatever would be this guy here. Does that make sense? Next question is, find the null space. Now, with this one, you've got to use the reduced echelon form, and so there is work to find the null space. Now, I can tell you what the dimension of the null space is. How many pivots do I have? Three pivots. How many free variables do I have? What's the size of this matrix? Four by five, I got three pivots, which means the rest of them have to be not pivots to match up to that five. That was that formula that I talked about. So how many is that? Two. And you can look at them here in two. So I'm going to write this guy as a, an equation. So this represents like an X1, an X2, an X3, an X4, and an X5. Remember, the null space is always set equal to zero. So I got the equation X1 plus X3 plus x5 equals 0. I got the equation x2 minus 2x3 plus x5 equals 0. And I got the equation x3 minus 5x5 equals 0. From here to here. Question. Hold on. Did I screw something up? 1, 1, 1. x2... 
minus 2x3 plus, oh, I think you, I did 3x5, thank you. And then uh, x, uh, x3 is, it, let's see here, whoa, wait a minute, who's that guy? That should be an x4, should it not be? x4 minus 5x5 equals 0. All right. Does that make sense? Thank you for noticing that. Now, solve for the pivots. Who are the pivots? And here it is, x1, x2, and x4. Solving for the pivots, x1, x2, and x4. Solving for the pivots would be a negative x3 minus an x5. Let me try to put these guys in order here. Minus an x5 there. Uh, x2, moving this stuff over, will be a 2x3 minus a 3x5. X3 is free, so it's equal to X3. X4, but moving it over here, would be just a 5. X5, moving to the other side. And X5 is free, so he's equal to X5. Does that make sense? So who are my free variables? They're equal to themselves. The X3 uh, and the X5 are free. Does that make sense? Now, because when you write this thing out, I got x1, x2, x3, x4, x5 is equal to, factor out the x3s, negative 1, 2, 1, 0, 0. That's times x3 plus negative 1, negative 3, 0. 5 and 1 x5. Does that make sense? So when I ask for what the null space is, null space will be the span of the vectors. And it's these vectors here. Negative 1, 2, 1, 0, 0. And the other vector is negative 1, negative 3, 0, 5, 1. And notice it has a dimension of 2. And because these guys are using the reduced echelon form, this would also be as a standard basis. It's got a bunch of zeros in there, as most you can get in terms of this thing here. Okay? But the last one, this is part A, this is part B. What is part C? You're supposed to tell me what the column space of A is. Well, being a space, it's going to be a span of what? Well, here's the deal. I've already got the reduced echelon form. I noticed the pivots are in X1, X3, and X4. That would be the first column, the second column, and the fourth column. So, therefore, my column space would be the span of the set of vectors of negative 2, 1, 3, 1, negative 5, 3, 11, 7, and 0, 1, 7, 5. And notice this. This is my answer. Notice I did not ask you to put it in standard basis form. Because the standard basis, i got to get there and do something called reduced column echelon form. Or I could do a transpose and do reduced echelon form or a transpose and then transpose it back and then I could get it into the columns in terms of equivalence. And, and I should talk about standard basis that way. But too much work. Does that make sense? And notice all I did was pay attention to the basis. But with the row space, because we are doing reduced row echelon form, there's two ways of writing your answer. But when you use the, when you use the reduced row echelon form matrix, that's called the standard basis. When you use the original basis, that's uh, original matrix, that's just uh, another basis. Does that make sense? Notice something or other. What is the difference between the dimension of the row space and the dimension of the column space? What's the dimension of the row space? Remember, definition of dimension is the number of vectors in the basis. What is the dimension of the row space? How much? 
three. One, two, three. And we're not talking about the number of uh, entries into the uh, into the vectors themselves. That's the subspace of what you. Are. That is what you are a subspace of. We're talking about the dimension of the actual space. These are subspaces of R four and of R five. That's a that's a five down there. Okay, fine. I don't care about that. I'm talking about in terms of dimension of the basis. So, what was the uh, dimension of row space? Three. What was the dimension of the column space? Three. Will that always be the case? Well, it's not always three, but are they going to always be equal? Yes or no? Why? Because? Because of the pivots. The pivots are telling us where the vectors that we have to have to be are linearly independent. And whether you're talking about the rows or the columns, the number of pivots will be the same on either way you go. That's right. So the dimension of the column space and the dimension of the row space will always be the same. Okay? Now the vectors may not be the same, but the, the, the actual dimension, the number of vectors in the basis based upon the pivots will be. All right. So, keep going here. Section 4.6 called Rank. Again, reinforcing the idea that I mentioned four other times, but with this rank, the first thing we're talking about is the dimension of a space or subspace is the number of vectors in its basis. Make sure that's in your notes if it hasn't been put in there 27 times already. Okay? The dimension of a space or subspace is the number of vectors in its basis. There's lots of different bases, but the number of vectors in the basis will always be the same. Definition. The rank of a matrix A is the dimension of the column. So this is a net definition here. The definition of the rank of a matrix A is the dimension of the column space. So in this last problem I just did, what's the rank of A? Three, because I had three vectors in the column space. The rank of a matrix A is the dimension of the column space of A, which you know is based upon the reduced ratio on form of A and the number of pivots that you get in A. So the rank of a matrix A is the number of pivots in its reduced row echelon form, but the strict definition is going to be the rank of a matrix A is the dimension of the column space of A. So when you hear the word rank, think of dimension of column space. Theorem 14 says this, the dimensions of the column space and the row space of an A M by N matrix are always equal. We just discussed that a few seconds ago because it's based upon, like you said, the number of pivots in the reduced rational echelon form. So the dimension of the column space and the row space of an M by N matrix are equal. This common dimension is the rank of A, and it also equals the number of pivots in A and satisfies the equation. Here it is. The rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A, which is also called nullity. There's another definition for you. The rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A, nullity of A, is always equal to N. And remember, A is an M by N matrix, so it's the rows by columns is equal to the number of columns in the original matrix. So this is your rank plus nullity formula. Rank plus nullity, nullity being the dimension of the null space, is always equal to N in your M by N matrix. So it's always equal to the number of columns. Okay? So, very, very important. Big theorem there. And a big formula using the new terminology. The dimension of the column space is now called the uh, rank of A. The dimension of the null space is called the nullity of A. Rank of A plus the nullity of A is equal to N in your M by N matrix. So I have a question for you. Here we go.
if A is an 7 by 9 matrix. If A is 7 by 9, such that the nullity of A is equal to 3, what's going to be the rank of A? You understand, these are very simple formulas as long as you understand the definitions and the formula. So, very simple. We know this. The rank of A plus the nullity of A has got to be equal to N. That's my rank plus nullity formula. The rank of A plus the nullity of A has got to be equal to what? If A is a 7 by 9 matrix, what's N going to be? None. But the nullity of A is 3. So the rank of A plus 3 has got to be equal to 9. Track three from both sides here. Okay, so the rank of A has got to be equal to what? Six. And remember, the definition of rank of A is the dimension, so you're expecting a number, of the column space of A. The rank of A is the column space of A, the, the dimension of the column space of A. Does that make sense? So this is a 10-second question. So here's another 10-second question. Well, maybe 20 seconds because we have a could in front of it. So here it is. Could a matrix A that is 6 by 9, so we've increased it a little bit, have a two-dimensional null space of A? Why or why not? Okay. I have a 6 by 9 matrix. Okay. Uh, and we have a two-dimensional null space of A. Is it possible or impossible? Why or why not? Well, again, anytime they're talking about null space of A and dimension, you should go to this formula. Rank of A plus the nullity, meaning the dimension of the null space, of A is equal to N in your M by N formula. That's classic formula. All right. So the rank of A plus what is the nullity of A if you have a two-dimensional null space of A? Two. Remember, the nullity is the dimension of the null space. So I'm basically telling you that the nullity is two. Nullity of A is two because the nullity, by definition, nullity of A is the dimension of the null space. And it's equal to N. Now, I gave you N because we have a 6 by 9 formula, so it's equal to 9. Does that make sense? Can you solve for the column space of A? I mean, you mean the rank of A? I mentioned the column space. Can you solve for the rank of A? What's rank of A equal to? But remember, the rank of A is equal to the dimension of the column space of A. And we're saying that that's 7. Is that possible or impossible? Why is it impossible? Shook your head. No, go for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because the, uh, the matrix is only uh, 6 by 9, so that's the second All right. Dimension. So it's because we have a 6 by 9 matrix. What is the maximum number of pivots you can actually have on this guy? The maximum number of pivots has got to be six. Does that make sense? Because if you've got a pivot in every, quote, row, one pivot, two pivot, three pivot, four pivot, five pivot, six pivot down here, you're going to have a bunch of uh, other numbers over here, and that's fine. So a bunch of other numbers on this thing. You've got zeros above and below it. That's great. But because of that, the max number or the max number of pivots is 6. So the max rank of A has got to be 6. We're sitting there talking about the rank of A being equal to 7. So this is 
impossible. Does that make sense? So that M by N, that M will matter in terms of these formulas and stuff because that M by N, M will be the maximum number of pivots you can actually have. Maybe less, but at most you can have is that M by N, in this case, 6 by 9. The maximum number of pivots is 6. And because they're talking about the rank of 7, if you use your formula, that's going to be impossible. Uh, that is why. So the answer to the question, uh, could you? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. So right here, again, what I'm after is can't. have the maximum number of pivots being six and having the rank or the dimension of the column space being seven because dimension of the column space is the number of pivots you got to have. And then the last thing here on this section is the invertible matrix theorem. Okay? Kind of tying all this stuff together as we're playing with it. And it's this. Let A be a n by n. We're going to talk about square matrix now because we're going to talk about invertible matrix, so it's got to be square. So let A be an n by n matrix. Then the following statements are equivalent. And remember I talked to you guys about this in the beginning of the semester. The famous TFAE. You're going to see any kind of upper level, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 8,000 level of math class. A math professor is going to use the famous letters TFAE. The following are equivalent. So, no, because we don't like to write a bunch of words out here. And here are the following. The columns of A form a basis of Rn. The column of A is equal to Rn. The dimension of the column space of A will be equal to N. The rank of A is equal to N. The null space of A is equal to 0. The dimension of the null space of A is equal to zero. A is an invertible matrix. So these are all equivalent. Well, does it, is it always that the column space of A is going to be equal to the number of pivots, which is N? No, it can be N or fewer. But if you've got an invertible matrix, if you've got an invertible matrix, when you do reduced echelon form on an invertible matrix, N by N, what is A going to convert into? How do you find an inverse? What do you do? You take matrix A, you augment with the identity. And then you reduce rho echelon form on A, and because it's invertible, it'll turn into the identity. And when you augment with the identity, the identity will actually turn into the inverse. Remember how the process of getting the inverse. So if you've got an N by N matrix, and it reduces, when you reduce rho echelon form to the identity, how many pivots do you have? N. So... The dimension of the column space of A would be N, which by definition, that's the rank of A, is going to be N. So if you know the rank of A, which is the dimension of the column space of A, is going to be N. So you've got to have N vectors on this thing. Now, we're talking about the column space of A, and you've got N vectors on these guys. So, and, uh, so with these N vectors here, it's going to be, you know, it's got subspace, it's going to be equal to Rn. And by the way, here you go. Remember, your rank plus nullity is equal, equals n. So if the rank is n plus the nullity of what is equal to n, what does the nullity have to be? Zero. And so the dimension is going to be zero because uh, the zero dimension means you only get the zero vector out of it. So in other words, when I'm looking for the null space of A, if all I get is the zero vector itself, and remember A was originally a square matrices, then automatically uh, I get all these things equivalent. A is going to be invertible. The rank of A is going to be in. Dimension of the column space is in. Uh, column space of A will actually be the space Rn, and the columns of A will form a basis for Rn. So all of these things are equivalent. Okay? So, last little set over here. This one out of the way. Try to keep my little notes in order here. Oh. 
Last little section is 4.7, putting it all together. The famous change of basis, okay? Section 4.7 is this. Let V be a vector space. And let beta be the basis of V. Then, for any vector X inside of V, the X with the little pointy brackets around a beta is the unique coordinates, remember this guy, we're coming back and re revisiting coordinates again, of vector X in the form of the basis of beta. Okay? Now, you're focusing on a particular basis, beta. And so X, with a little pointy brackets around it and a subscript beta, is the coordinates, it's the coefficients you put in front of the, ve the basis vectors to be able to get X out of it again. But wait a minute, new. No. If C is a different basis for V, then how are the coordinates of X relative to basis beta and X relative to basis C, a new basis, going to be related? All right. Remember what I said before about code theory. We're going to try to basically hide these uh, these these pieces of the puzzle that I have, like your credit card numbers and things like that, uh, where you've got this idea of a basis. But you need to keep switching the basis up to keep the hackers confused. But you got to be able to convert. Oh, this is one. This 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 vector was done yesterday when we coded it. We got a new basis today, so we're going to have a new different coordinate system. Can I convert the old coordinate system to the new coordinate system? How are these guys related? That's the big deal here. So, theorem. Let beta be equal to the basis v1, v2, v3, all the way up through bn. This is the basis vectors for beta. Let C, because we're math people, don't think too deep in this, be equal to C1, C2, dot, 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 to Cn. Both be basis for a uh, vector space V. So I got two different bases. I got V and C, beta and C, if you will. What do you notice about both of them, how I wrote them out? The one thing I want you to guys to pay attention to is the number of vectors in each one. What's the number of vectors in each one? They both have N. Does that make sense? The dimension of the space is going to be a number, and so I don't care what basis you choose, they're all going to have the same number of vectors in that basis. That's the dimension of the space. In this case, it'll be n. Then there is a unique n by n matrix, and I'm going to call him P, and look at, we, we, we look at this notation, and this is our textbook notation type thing here, of how to convert one to the other. And I'm afraid you're going to have to read it like you read... Uh, Hebrew or uh, uh, Aramaic or whatever, it's going to be from right to left, from B converting to C. There's a reason why we do it this way, because I'm setting you guys up with the format and the formula. So beta, I'm excuse me, P will convert from beta, vec, uh, beta coordinates to the C basis coordinates, such that the X relative to C will be equal to this P matrix going from B to C times your X uh, coordinates relative to the B. So you multiply the B's, kind of match up over here, and they match up and cancel, and it's going to convert your coordinates to C vector coordinates instead of C basis coordinates instead of B to beta coordinates. Okay? The columns of this matrix P going from beta to C are the C coordinates of the vectors in the basis B, i.e., this is the deal here. How do I create this particular uh, matrix? Beta going from B to C. It's going to be the vector B1, the first ve beta vector, B, first vector in beta, B1. And we're going to look at the coordinates relative to C. You take the second vector in uh, basis B beta, B2, and make him a coordinate and figure out what the coordinates of that vector is in terms of C, dot, dot, dot. And you take the last vector, Bn, in terms of your basis beta, convert that into coordinates of uh, basis C, and that's how you create these. These will be the columns, and this will be your matrix type thing here. Note, as x 
relative to basis C is equal to your P matrix going from B to C times your X coordinates relative to B. Then P going from B to C inverse, you move them to the other side, times X relative to C will be equal to the coordinates X relative to B. If you can convert one to the other, you can go back again. And this, this matrix P going from C to B will actually be equal to the matrix P going from B to C inverse. If you want to switch the directions, you take your matrix and invert them. So, what we're actually doing here is this. Now, I, the big question is, this looks like a lot of work. Well, is it? Well, maybe. So we're going to figure out a way how to do this. So, here we go. So to find this, and this is what we're looking after, this guy there right here, B going from uh, P matrix going from B to C. This is how you would think about doing it, but man, that's a pain in the butt. So here's the real rule. To find the matrix P going from B to the C, you have C vectors, this is your basis for C, C1, C2 out to Cn, and you've got a basis for beta vectors, uh, this is a basis, B1 out to Bn, B the basis of vector space C. So to find matrix P going from B to C, then augment the column matrix. Okay, we're going from, now look at the order. This is what I want to pay attention to to make this stuff not so confusing because these subscripts can get old and quick. I can be confused quickly, but going from B to C, I'm going to set up an augmented matrix. Over here on the left, I'm going to put the C column vectors in there, the basis for C. Augment over here on the right, I'm going to put the B basis vectors in here. Okay? So I got two different bases. Remember, they're linearly independent. So when I can see, I got this big matrix here where I got these columns of basis vectors from C, augment with basis vectors from B in order, and then I reduce racial form because these guys are linearly independent. They're going to turn into the identity I, and what happens to the B vectors, they actually will turn into the matrix that's going to be your transition matrix, going from basis B and converting them into basis C coordinates. This is how you find them. Now look at the order at which I do this because you know students in here are going to get this backwards and they'll put the basis in the wrong order. So to go from, if you're looking for the matrix P going from B to C, this is why we like this notation because when you augment, you put the C on the right and B on the left in terms of basis vectors and then row reduce it and then you'll get your tie in the same order. So this order matches to the augmented matrix order. That's another classic way of keeping your eye on this stuff because it's really easy to get these guys backwards. And what you're finding is P inverse instead of the P guy. And you've got them backwards and then you show it screwed up the whole thing. And again, you want this guy here so I can convert from one system of coordinates to another system of coordinates as we continue to change the basis elements for whatever vector space we're going to be looking at. Okay? So, you got to have a problem. So, I'm talking theory right now, and I know that when I talk theory, you guys' eyes roll back in your heads and stuff like that. So, what kind of question can I put on a test for you guys? Here's one right here. Okay. Find a change of coordinates matrix. So this is what I call it, change of coordinate matrix. From beta to C, where B, I went small on you guys, is the vector 7, 1, negative 2, 3, and C is equal to 4, negative 5, uh, vector negative, two, negative 1, 2 vector. Okay? So, here we go. I'm looking for this P matrix that takes the basis from B, here's the word, 2, which 
things I want to transfer them over here to see. This is what I want to find. But based upon what I just showed you, the formula for this is going to be, you take your C1, C2, da, 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 of the CN vectors, because that's on the left. You augment it with the V1, V2, dot, dot, out to the BN vectors, uh, BN vectors there. And then what you're going to do here is to be able to get this guy, you're going to reduce echelon form, and this guy will turn into the identity, and what you augment will turn into exactly the guy that you're looking for. So in this particular problem, I'm going to do this. C goes on the left. What are my C vectors? It is 4, negative 5, negative 1, 2. Now, order matters on this thing, but those are my vectors here and here. This is the C vectors. And over here, I'm going to put the beta vectors here, which is 7, 1, negative 2, 3. I put the beta vectors here. Okay? So let's do this one by hand in the last two minutes I have left in class. Because it's only two by, okay, it's two by four here. But what's your first move? I want to make that guy a pivot. So what's my first move? Well, I can't really do row reduction, so multiply by. All right. Sucks for you guys. One fourth times row one. What does that mean? One, negative one fourth. That's right, fractions. Augment, seven fourths, and then negative two fourths, which reduces to negative one half. And then I got negative 5, 2, 1, 3. What's my next move? Sweep down. Negative 5 times row 1, add it to row 2, replace row 2 with it. That means I get 1, negative 1 fourth, augmented with 7 fourths, negative 1 half. Here we go. 5 times uh, 1 is negative 5, plus negative 5 is 0. That was the point. 5 times negative 1 fourth is negative 5 fourths. So I got negative 5 fourths plus 2 makes it 3 fourths. 5 times 7 fourths plus 1. And I end up getting 9.75, which when you convert it to a fraction is 39 fourths. And then... Uh, 5 times negative 1 half is negative 5 halves plus 3 and that gives me 1.5 or 1 half and yes I'm doing this stuff on my calculator just to let you guys know okay good does that make sense now what's your next move make this guy pivot how do I do that I'm gonna multiply by 4 thirds by row 2 this will give me 1 negative one-fourth, augment seven-fourths, negative one-half. This would be zero, one. Now, when I multiply by four-thirds, the fourths cancel. What is 39 divided by three? Thirteen. And negative uh, one-half times four-thirds is a negative, I mean, excuse me, one-half times four-thirds is what? Two-thirds. And then I got one more move to make. What's my last move? Sweep up. Negative one-fourth times row two. Add it to row one, replace row one with that. That gives me zero, one, augment 13, two thirds. And this gives me one, zero, and I get five, negative one third. Therefore, what is the uh, change of coordinate matrix going from beta to C? What would be my matrix? It is the matrix five, negative one third, 13, Two thirds. That's going to be the matrix that will convert from coordinates from going from the beta matrix to coordinates of the C matrix. And so, there we go. And so, one more last thing, and I'll let you guys go. If you talk about your standard basis here, which is going for epsilon, we never put the epsilon here. This is the coordinate matrix. Converting beta into standard basis. This is for this is the uh, PC, which is the coordinate matrix converting uh, from C to the standard basis. You can actually create a little formula here to get this uh, P going from beta to C. You take 
P, P, C inverse, this guy here going from the coordinates to the standard, multiply it by the matrix that takes the uh, uh, beta, converting it to the standard matrix, and that will actually give you what you want. So you can actually go from through the standard matrix to be able to get these guys as well. So it's another nice little formula. But we'll work on more on this next time. Study hard on this. Don't forget Thursday, your homework number, whatever number we're up to, is due. Okay, five. <laughs> homework number five is due. And then soon thereafter, I'll be posting homework number six. So study hard and see you guys next time.